Hi guys, it's me, Professor Dean. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, we're doing another Kahoot and we're gonna be covering pediatric respiratory conditions. Before we get started, as always, I'm gonna ask you to please support me and support this channel by liking this video. Go ahead and give it a thumbs up. You're gonna love the video. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already and be sure to check out my website, Nexus Nursing Institute. You'll find lots of resources there, such as audio lessons for current nursing students. You can sign up for a Next Generation NCLEX review session, part one, part two. You can sign up for a tutoring session or a consultation session. Again, you can um, check out all these resources by going to my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Almost daily, you can find me covering a variety of nursing topics across my social media platforms, such as TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and of course, right here on YouTube. My handle's the same everywhere, Nexus Nursing. Without any further ado, guys, let's get started. Okay, you're caring for a patient who just ingested kerosene. Which would be your priority assessment? Would it be to check the respiratory rate? Would it be to check burns on the oral mucosa? Would it be to check the patient's bowel sounds? Or would it be to check for abdominal pain? Your patient just ingested kerosene. Which would be a priority assessment for this patient? Very good. Respiratory rate, why? For everyone, I saw 14 people chose check burns of oral mucosa, six people chose bowel sounds, uh, two people chose abdominal pain. Let me tell you something. None of those matter if your patient's not breathing. If your patient is dead, who cares about those burns that are around their mouth or them being in pain? Guess what? They're not gonna be in pain because they're dead. So we need that patient to be breathing. Remember, oxygen is what is fueling that patient's whole system. We need them to be alive. So remember, airway, breathing, circulation, airway always comes first, except if we're doing CPR, obviously you're doing compressions first, right? But other than that, your patient needs to be breathing. So that's going to be your first priority. Let me double check again, just to make sure I'm recording here. Okay, good. All right, next question. Albuterol has been ordered for your patient that has asthma. Why would this medication be ordered? Is it to relax the smooth muscles of the airways? Is it to decrease airway inflammation? Is it to remove fluids from the lungs? Or is it to loosen and thin pulmonary secretions? Why do you think this patient um, is getting albuterol? Very good. It's to relax the smooth muscles of the airways because if the patient that has asthma, they can't breathe, they're having an asthma attack. Well, what's happening in asthma? Hyperconstriction of the airways, right? And so oxygen is not getting through the airway appropriately. So we're going to give them something like albuterol, which is fast acting that will um, relax and th relax those smooth muscles so that the patient can actually breathe. Now, 18 people chose to decrease airway inflammation. Um, to decrease airway inflammation, that would be something like steroids, right? Steroids have an anti-inflammatory effect. One person chose to remove fluids from the lungs. I'm happy only one person chose that. We want to remove fluids. Patient would get something like what? Diuretics to remove fluids. And last, to loosen or thin pulmonary secretions. Um, well, with that, we patient would be get something like um, mucolytic. That would be something that would loosen and thin the secretions. But when we're talking about um, asthma, we're going to want to give something that's actually going to relax the smooth muscle and decrease the hyperconstriction that is happening in asthma. All right, type in your answer. After how many hours of antibiotic therapy should the patient with strep throat throw away their toothbrush? Type in your answers. After how many hours of antibiotic therapy should the patient that has strep throat throw away their toothbrush and get a new one? How many hours? After how many hours? What do you guys say? If you guys are not on the Kahoot, you can type your answers in the live. Okay, so let me put 
review answers. I see 48, 12, 72, three hours, one month. I said, how many hours does somebody put one month? Really, guys? So the correct answer is 24 hours. So, And here's why. The patient that has strep throat, um, strep is a type of uh, bacteria. So it's that bacteria that's causing the infection the patient has in their throat, right? So they have strep throat. They have this infectious bacterial infection in their throat, and they're getting antibiotics. Well, after they've been on antibiotics for a full 24 hours, they need to throw away their toothbrush and use a new one. Why? We don't want them to keep reinfecting themselves because that bacteria that they have, where you think it's going to go on the throat? And every time they brush their teeth, they're going to keep reinfecting themselves. So after they've been on that antibiotic, for a full 24 hours, we expect them to throw away that toothbrush. That's what you're going to teach a patient to do and use a new one. By the way, when it comes to strep throat, remember guys, you expect the patient to be on something like penicillin, amoxicillin. If the patient's allergic to penicillin, you would expect them to be on something like erythromycin or zithromycin. All right. Okay. Next question. All right, so your patient presents with pharyngitis, dysphagia, the WBCs are 20,000, and the throat culture shows H influenza type B. What tentative diagnosis would you expect for the patient to have? Let me move this out the way. I'm sorry. Would you expect them to have tonsillitis, asthma, bronchitis, emphysema, tuberculosis, or epiglottitis? Your patient presents with pharyngitis, that sore throat, dysphagia, difficulty swallowing, WBC of 20,000, and the throat culture shows H influenza type B. What do you expect that your patient has? And the correct answer is epi epiglottitis. And I'm happy most of you guys, not most of you guys, but there are more that chose the right answer than the wrong, but it's pretty split. 13 of you guys chose epiglottitis, which is a correct answer. So remember, guys, I taught you when you see the word ends in itis, that means inflammation of. So epiglottitis is inflammation of what? The epiglottis, okay? Here's the thing you guys need to know about epiglottitis. Um, epiglottitis very often is a complication or it's something that results after uh, from um, influenza, the patient having the flu. Okay, commonly results from the flu. So the fact, and by the way, patient has epiglottitis, you are going to be so concerned about their airway, but we're going to talk about that later. Um, look at the symptoms that the patient has. They've got a sore throat. So we know what's going on with them is going to be in the throat. They have difficulty swallowing. We know it's going to be in the throat. WBC of 20,000, guys, normal WBC is five to 10,000. So if this patient has WBCs of 20,000, that lets you know this infection is really, really, really bad as you would see in epiglottitis. And here's what sealed the deal. You put all of these symptoms together and then they tell you that the throat culture was done and you saw the patient had influenza type B. What diagnosis would you expect? Yeah, epiglottitis. Let's look at the other choices, guys. So we have tonsillitis. Tonsillitis is inflammation of the tonsils. Asthma, we talked about asthma. That's hyperconstriction of the airway. Bronchitis, emphysema. You see those two guys? Those are part of COPD. Asthma used to be, but it's no longer. And I'm going to explain to you why. Asthma is reversible. If a patient's having an asthma attack, they'll getting they'll get a short acting bronchial agonist. Um, and guess what? A beta agonist, excuse me. And then the hyperconstriction reverses. Guess what? COPD does not reverse. COPD is progressive and irreversible. Bronchitis and emphysema are part of COPD. They are progressive and irreversible. Let me talk to you about these two before we move on. Bronchitis, but, but, bronchitis. They are, but, but, blue bloaters. Patients with bronchitis turn to 10 tend to turn blue. And the reason they turn blue is because of the cyanosis. They're holding on to all that CO2. And so they're not getting enough oxygen. So they tend to be blue, blue bloater. Where does the bloater come from? That barrel chest they have. Why do they have the barrel chest? Because they're holding on to all that CO2. Okay. So when you think of but, but bronchitis, I want you to think of a but, but blue bloater. Emphysema, on the other hand, is a pink puffer. 
Why are they pink? Well, because they're holding on to all this CO2, the body tries to compensate and it makes all of these RBCs because remember the RBCs carry hemoglobin. Hemoglobin carries oxygen. So it's the body trying to compensate for all that CO2. So you see that patient looking pink, right? Because of all the RBCs being produced. Pink puffer. Why are they a puffer? Again, they have the barrel chest. They're holding on to all that CO2. Next. Tuberculosis. Tuberculosis, this is um, um, the a bacterium that can actually affect any organ in the body, but it usually affects the lungs. Okay. And last, epiglottitis, which we talked about. And we'll talk about uh, tuberculosis in a little bit, either in this Kahoot or I have to make another part two. We'll go more in depth in part two if I didn't get to it in this Kahoot. How are you guys doing on the live? Good. Okay. Next question. All right. Select all that applies. Your new admits diagnosed with acute epiglottitis. Patient has a fever. They're lethargic. They have dyspnea and dysphagia. What nursing interventions are you going to include? Select all that applies. Take vital signs. Also take lung sounds. Observe the patient swallowing. Obtain the throat culture. Make sure the patient's comfortable by decreasing their anxiety, administering insulin as ordered. You have a new patient. They've been diagnosed with acute epiglottitis. They have a fever. They are lethargic. They have dyspnea, which means they have difficulty breathing. They have dysphagia, which means they have difficulty swallowing. What nursing interventions are you going to include? Taking vitals, auscultating lung sounds, observing the patient swallowing, obtaining a throat culture, making the patient comfortable by decreasing anxiety, and administering insulin. Select all that applies. All right. Ooh, okay. Everything except for green and purple. So let's talk about the right answers first and I'll get to the wrong answers. Yes, you always want to assess your patient. You're going to take vital signs. You're going to also auscultate lung sounds because guess what? If they have dyspnea, difficulty breathing, hello, dysphagia, difficulty swallowing, you're going to want to assess the lung sounds. You want to see is, you know, is that air moving? You're going to want to observe them swallowing. They have dysphagia. You're going to want to make them comfortable, decrease anxiety, because the more anxious a patient becomes, right, we are, may deal with tachypnea, right, because it's because of their anxiety, and we don't want to deal with that. But two things we're not going to do, never in your life, you see the answer of obtaining a throat culture? Well, how would you get a throat culture? You'd have to stick something in their mouth. You'd have to stick something in their throat in order to get that culture, right? Never. You never do that in a patient that has this diagnosis, which, which is epiglottitis. It would have been different. If you if the patient had um, tonsillitis, yes, we'll do a throat culture all day. But when it comes to epiglottitis, the you just make doing that a swab in their throat is enough for their airway to close up. We're not going to take that chance. So when it comes to epiglottitis, you don't stick anything in their mouth, okay? We're not going to do a throat culture. And of course, we're not going to give insulin. We give insulin to patients with hyperglycemia. We give insulin to patients who are diabetic. This has nothing to do with what we're talking about. I just threw that in to throw you guys off, right? But please, if you guys um, are studying this for a test, I'm telling you right now, when it comes to epiglottitis, you never do a swab of their throat. You don't put anything into their mouth. You don't want their airway closing up on them. All right, select all that applies. Which is a sign of hemorrhage after a tonsillectomy? Select all that applies. So your patient just had a tonsillectomy. Which are signs of hemorrhage? Frequent swallowing, increased RBCs, decreased RBCs, infrequent swallowing, Hypertension, hypotension. Select all that apply.
The pin to get in is 24373. 24373. Okay, let's talk about it. So we know after any invasive procedure, we're always going to be concerned. One of our concerns is going to be hemorrhage. Tonsillectomy, removal of the tonsils, that's an invasive procedure. What are the signs and symptoms of hemorrhage? Frequent swallowing, yes. You see them gulping, swallowing. What do you think they're swallowing? Blood. Yep. Decreased RBCs, absolutely. You see those RBCs going down, you better suspect, and hypotension. Signs and symptoms of hemorrhage. Like we saw the decreased um, RBCs, blood pressure going down, patients swallowing frequently. Also, if you see the hemoglobin drop, if you see urine output decrease, if you see heart rate increase, if you see these signs and symptoms together, you better be suspecting hemorrhage not increased RBCs. If that patient's bleeding, we're going to see the RBCs go opposite way. They're going to go down and not hypertension. If the patient's losing blood, their blood pressure is going to go down. It's not going to go up. All right. You're teaching a child with asthma how to use an MDI, a meter dose inhaler. Which teaching would be correct? Never shake the canister before administration. Take two puffs, one immediately after the other. Take only one puff of the medication. There should be a two to three inch space between the inhaler and the open mouth. Which teaching is correct? Sorry, guys, I'm trying to make it big for you. Okay. So most of you guys chose the correct answer. There should be a two to three inch space between the inhaler and the open mouth. Absolutely. Now, um, eight of you guys chose never shake the canister, uh, before, um, administration. Remember, this is something aerosolized. You want to shake because shaking it provides better, um, what's the word I'm looking delivery, better delivery of the medication. So you're going to teach them to always shake that canister before use. Nine of you guys chose take two puffs, one immediately after the other. You know what word makes that wrong? Immediately. Absolutely not. We do want you to take two puffs, but guess what? You got to wait one minute. One minute. You're going to take the two puffs one minute after the other. Um, And 13 of you said to take only one puff of the medication. Guys, because you saw that word only in there, you should have known that was wrong. How many times have I told you? Answers that include always, never, only, those type of all-inclusive, stay away from them. They're always, no, I shouldn't say always. They're usually never the correct answer. Stay away from all-inclusives, okay? All right, so you just suctioned your patient. Uh, which finding would indicate that the procedure was effective? Increased respirations, decreased diaphoresis, clear breath sounds, or capillary refill less than three seconds. You just suctioned your patient, which finding would indicate that the procedure was effective? Thank you, Anita. That's right, clear breath sounds. Why do you think you're suctioning your patient? So you suction the patient, you, you want to get that fluid out. So you hear clear breath sounds, not increased respirations. You see increased respirations that would most likely indicate, okay, something's wrong. Why are those respirations increased? Okay. Because when a patient is not getting enough oxygen, the first thing we're going to do, it, the first thing we're going to see is increase in the rates. That's bad. Not that decreased diaphoresis, that's not why we're suctioning the patient. Capillary refill, that has to do with circulation, not with respirations. 
All right, your patient just had a tonsillectomy. Which fluid item would you offer the patient? Would it be crushed ice? Would it be lemonade? Would it be strawberry milkshake or grapefruit juice? Your patient just had a tonsillectomy. Which fluid item do you think is best to offer the patient? Very good. Most of you guys chose the correct answer, crush ice. Why? The ice is going to be soothing and it's clear. Remember, we're worried about bleeding. So if um, the patient spits up or they vomit, it's clear, right? It's not like it has a red or pink color that might confuse us and we don't know, okay, was it something they drank or ate or is it actually blood? It's clear. Lemonade, absolutely not. We don't want to give a patient who just had a tonsillectomy, anything acidic, anything that can burn that uh, surgical site. Strawberry milkshake. Well, there's two things wrong with the strawberry milkshake. Number one, the color, that pinkish color. We don't want to give the patient anything pinkish because remember, we need to be watching out for bleeding, right? So that's number one. And number two, strawberry milkshake. You know what milk produces? Lots of mucus. This patient who just had a tonsillectomy, they got the surgical site here. We don't want them to do anything to disrupt the surgical site, such as coughing, scratching their throat, going like doing that sound. We don't want them to do any of that. So we're not going to give them anything with dairy. Absolutely not. And grapefruit juice, again, it's acidic. We're not going to give anything acidic to the patient. So the correct answer is crushed ice. It's soothing and it's clear. All right. Which expiratory flow rates shows that the patient's asthma is under good control? Meaning the patient's asymptomatic. Would it be the green zone, the yellow zone, the red zone, or the white zone? The code to get in is 24373. 24373. Very good. Green zone. That means the patient's asthma is under good control. Patient's not exhibiting any symptoms. Now, the yellow zone is problematic. Patient is symptomatic, right? Patient's going to need a short-acting beta agonist. They're going to need what? Albuterol, right? They're going to need uh, relief medicine. Red zone, that is bad. Not only is that patient symptomatic, they're symptomatic bad, like let me tell you, if that patient's in the red zone, you're going to give them the albuterol, but also do what? Call 911. And white zone, I just made that up. I can't, 16 people chose that. I, I just made it up. It means nothing. So um, the correct answer, if the patient's asymptomatic, no symptoms, asthma's under good control, they are in the green zone. Select all that applies. Your asthma patient is pale. They have dry mucous membranes, nasal flaring, cracked lips. Which actions would you perform? Select all that apply. Would you obtain a pulse ox, obtain vital signs, assess lung sounds, administer a nebulizer treatment as ordered, elevate the head of the bed, lower the head of the bed? What would you do? You have an asthmatic patient that's pale. They've got dry mucous membranes. They're exhibiting nasal flaring. You're seeing cracked lips. What are your nursing actions going to be? Everyone that's sharing the live, thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, sweet tea. Aliyah, thank you. Everyone sharing the live, I appreciate it. Okay. Everything except lower the head of the bed. You're going to get a pulse ox because you want to know 
um, what's going on with your patient, right? You want to know how much oxygen is being delivered to those tissues. You want to know what that perfusion is looking like. And let me tell you something. The normal pulse ox is 95 to 100. Once that patient hits 91, they are in acute respiratory distress. So you better be getting the SAO2. Now, do not confuse the SAO2, which is an oxygen saturation rate, with the PaO2, which is a partial pressure of oxygen. Remember how I told you SAO2, which is the oxygen saturation rate, you want that between 95 and 100? Well, your PaO2, the normal range for that is 80 to 100. So make sure you guys know the difference. Moving on, you're going to take the patient's vital signs. Absolutely. You want to assess your patient. You're going to assess for lung sounds. Are they clear? Are you hearing wheezing? Are you hearing strider? <gasps> Strider, a medical emergency. Are you hearing crackles? You're going to listen to those lung sounds. Absolutely, guys. Remember, when it comes to lung sounds, even though you can designate vital signs to a UAP or a PN, listening to lung sounds, you cannot because the UAP or PN has not been trained to differentiate the different types of lung sounds that I just mentioned. Okay. So absolutely, you're going to assess the patient's lung sounds. You're going to administer a nebulizer treatment as ordered. It looks like they need a nebulizer. They need some albuterol, right? So you're going to give that as ordered, but of course you got to assess your patient first. And of course, elevate the head of the bed. Let me tell you something across the board, when it comes to respirations for adults or children, if there's any problems with breathing, you're going to elevate the head of the bed. Why? We want gravity to help us, right? Your diaphragm sits like this, right under your lungs. You take a deep breath in, your diaphragm drops to make room for air. And then you breathe out, it pops back up. This is the resting position. So if you want your patient to take a deep breath, doesn't it make sense to sit them up so all of their fat and abdominal girth is pushing up against their diaphragm? Plus, um, um, gravity can help push that diaphragm down so the patient can take a deep breath and the lungs can expand. It makes sense. So the only thing that's wrong here that we're not going to do here is lower the head of the bed. You guys did great on this question. All right, so your patient is two hours post-op from a tonsillectomy. What would make you suspect that there's a complication happening here? Would it be complaints of dysphagia? Would it be dried blood at the corners of the mouth? Would it be frequent swallowing? Or would it be dark colored emesis? Your patient's two hours post-op tonsillectomy. What would make you suspect that there's a complication? Very good. Frequent swallowing. What are they swallowing? Blood, right? Frequent swallowing. So let's look at the other choices. Nine people chose complaints of dysphagia. That's um, um, difficulty swallowing. They just had a tonsillectomy. The tonsils right here in the throat. They're going to have pain at the surgical site. Of course, they're going to have dysphagia. That's not a complication. That's something that we, that's a side effect of the um, surgery. That's something that we expect to happen. That's not a complication. So that's wrong. I'm happy nobody chose dry blood around the mouth because if that blood is dry, what does that mean? It's not active bleeding. This is bleeding from the surgery, right? Dried blood or dark colored blood, that means old blood because blood does what? It coagulates old blood. What we're concerned about is bright red blood. That means fresh active bleeding, right? So we're not going to be concerned about dark colored emesis as well because that emesis, the reason it's dark is from what? older blood because the patient just had an invasive procedure. What we would have been concerned would have been bright red blood. So yes, the frequent swallowing, we're concerned that that patient's bleeding out. So remember, you suspect that patient's bleeding out. What are you going to be assessing? Um, urine output dropping. You know, a patient's supposed to have at least 30 mLs per hour. So you see the urine output going down. You see the blood pressure going down. You see the RBCs down. You see H&H &H down. You see um, respirations and heart rate up. All of those together paint you a picture of hemorrhage. How are you guys doing on the live? Okay, let's keep going. Select all that applies. All right, you're caring for an asthmatic patient. What are the indications of deterioration in the patient's respiratory stat status? What are signs or symptoms to let you know that they're, they're deteriorating, okay? 
the O2 sat being 95%, them wheezing, them having retractions of the sternal muscles, them having warm extremities, them displaying nasal flaring, or them having anxiety and irritability. You're caring for an asthmatic patient. What are indications of deterioration in the patient's respiratory status? Select all that apply. All right. I saw on the live, a lot of you guys said everything but green. How did you say everything but green, which means you included O2 sat 95% when I just told you normal range for O2 sat is 95 to 100. So even though it's on the low end of the normal, it's still normal. 95 to 100 guys. So 95 to 100 that doesn't mean the patient's deteriorating. That is normal range. Let's go over deterioration, that patient wheezing. You want to know why you're hearing the wheezing? When you hear that wheezing sound, that's the sound of air trying to pass through um, an airway that's being occluded, right? Remember, the patient's having hyperconstriction of the airway. So that sound you hear, that wheezing sound is air trying to pass through a, an airway that's closed. Uh, not closed, but uh, um, much uh, um, narrow. That is narrow. Retraction of sternal muscles. Whenever you see a patient using accessory muscles to breathe, you know that their respiratory status is deteriorating. Nasal flaring. You know what nasal flaring is? You see that in the newborns when they're having respiratory uh, deterioration. Their nose, it opens up like this because they're trying to get oxygen. And of course, anxiety and irritability. Let me tell you something. When you get a test question and you have a patient that is showing a sudden change in behavior or cognition, behavior or cognition, behavior, that's um, that irritability. Anxiety, cognition. Cognition is how you think. So you see the patient starts to have confusion. They start to have lethargy. Um, they start to have anxiety. They start to have irritability. The first thing that needs to be going to your to your brain is decrease oxygen to the brain. That's usually why we see those symptoms, right? So if you see patients start having anxiety or sometimes a test question, I'm going to tell you what it says. I'll tell you that it won't say the patient's anxious. They won't use the word anxious, but they'll say that the patient's like, basically they're scared to death to be le left alone. They beg you not to leave them alone. Well, that means they're anxious, right? They have a feeling of doom. They feel like something's terribly wrong. They feel like they're going to die, right? Usually, um, they're not getting enough oxygen to the brain. But O2 sat 95%, that's normal. And you see um, warm extremities. What do you think your extremities are supposed to feel like? They're supposed to feel warm. First of all, we're talking about respirations and not circulation. Ex warm extremities, that has to do with circulation. But let's talk about circulation for a minute. If we were talking about circulation, we want the extremities to be warm. What do you think is causes extremities to be warm? Blood flow. If something's wrong and the patient's not getting blood flow to the extremity, instead of being warm, the extremity is going to be what? Cool or cold. That is bad. That means oxygen, which is being carried in the blood, is not being delivered to the tissues. So warm extremities, that's normal. Okay. Any questions? Any questions? Like you guys can talk back to me. I'm just joking. Let's keep going. All right. Next question. Which type of medication should the nurse teach the teenage patient to take before exercise? Would it be fluticasone, montelukast, prednisone, or albuterol? What type of med should the nurse teach the teenage patient or any patient for that matter to take before exercise? Very good. Very good. 
Um, and it's albuterol. So the patient who has exercise induced, um, asthma, right. Or the patient with asthma before they exercise, you're going to teach them to go ahead and take albuterol to take something that's going to go ahead and open dial cause dilation to the airways. Fluticasone, that's a corticosteroid. Montelukast, that's a leukotriene uh, receptor antagonist. And prednisone, of course, that's another corticosteroid. Very quickly before I move on to the next slide, corticosteroids, um, just so you know, when you think of corticosteroids, there's going to always be four concerns. Okay. You're going to be worried about sugar because it causes sugar to go up. You're going to be concerned about hyperglycemia. You better be checking the patient's blood sugar. You're going to be concerned about steroids. Safety. You're going to be concerned about uh, osteoporosis because steroids tend to make the bones porous. You're going to be concerned about ulcers because steroids are very hard on the stomach. That's why you have to give it with food. And the last thing of, oh, you're going to be concerned about infection. Remember, steroids have an anti-inflammatory effect. They can mask the signs and symptoms of infection. So any patients taking steroids, you have to check them more closely. Pay attention to their temp. Just a slight elevation in temp. That patient may have a fever, a bad fever. Just a slight elevation WBC, WBCs, and they may already have a bad fever. So you have to um, assess them much, much more closely. Now, of course, the answer to this question is not a steroid. It is albuterol, again, a short-acting beta agonist. But I just wanted to mention steroids to you because that was something important for you guys to know. All right, last slide. This was a long one. Select all that apply. Which interventions would you include for your patient with asthma? Select all that apply. Perform chest percussions. Sit the patient upright, monitor their O2 sat, administer bronchodilators as ordered, administer Dornase Alpha as ordered, administer Epitin Alpha as ordered. It's a select all that applies to your patient has asthma. Which um, nursing interventions would you include for that patient? This was a long one. I'm tired. Are you guys tired on the live? <laughs> oh, you guys are full of energy. All right, let's talk about it. So 26 of you guys chose perform chest percussion. All right, guys, I have a question for you. What are you doing for that patient when you're doing chest percussion? Look at the diagnosis. I said asthma. Remember, asthma is hyperconstriction of the airway. Do chest percussions open up the patient's airway? No. Chest percussion is used to loosen up secretion so the patient can cough them up, right? So hypersecretions, is that a problem with asthma? No, that would be for a patient that has something like cystic fibrosis. So we're not doing chest percussion on an asthma patient. We'd be doing that on a patient who has something like cystic fibrosis. So that's not the answer. Next, sit the patient upright. 77 of you guys chose it. Absolutely. Because remember, if it's a respiratory condition, we want that patient to sit upright. Very good. Next, monitor the patient's O2 sat. Absolutely. If it has to do with respirations, we're going to be checking the O2 sat and we want it between 95 and 100. Next, administer bronchodilators as ordered. Absolutely. Albuterol, which is... um. Uh, short-acting beta agonist. It is a bronchodilator. That's what it does. It opens up the airways. Absolutely. Now, <laughs> eight people chose administer Dornase Alpha as ordered. Guys, Dornase Alpha, Dornase Alpha, that's a medication we would give for a patient with cystic fibrosis. I noticed I did touch on cystic fibrosis um, on this video. It's going to be on another Kahoot because I got to do a whole teaching session with that. But I have other videos, uh, lectures and uh, QA videos on cystic fibrosis. If you want to watch those before I make the next Kahoot, it's already on my YouTube channel. But anyway, Dornase Alpha, make sure you know that medication. That's something we'd give for cystic fibrosis. And last, 
14 people chose administer Epitin Alpha as ordered. Epitin Alpha, that's a medication that we would give for a patient with, um, with, oh my gosh, on the live, someone typed uh, anemia. Thank you, anemia, right? So this medication helps um, erythropoiesis, erythropoiesis, so the patient makes, excuse me, more RBCs because remember, RBCs carry hemoglobin, hemoglobin carries oxygen. So that would be for a patient that's anemic. So we want the patient to sip upright. We're going to check their O2 sat. We're going to give them bronchodilators as ordered. And guys, that is the end of the Kahoot. Let's see how well you guys did.